pupils, how are you feeling today? I hope you are all staying safe at home and you are ready to learn science with me. I am Sariful Asra Binti Rozali from SMK Raja Abdullah, Kuala Lumpur. Before we begin, pupils, do you know the name of the most common virus in the world today? According to the World Health Organization, it is the 2019 coronavirus disease which is better known as COVID-19. So, how dangerous is this disease? How is this disease transmitted? What are the preventive measures that we can take to prevent this disease? Well, these are the questions that we are going to find out the answers to in today's lesson. Boys and girls, we have two content standards for today's topic. Number one, the infectious and non-infectious diseases. And number two is body defense system. At the end of today's lesson, you should be able to 1. Differentiate and communicate about infectious and non-infectious diseases. 2. Explain how infectious diseases are spread. 3. Separate the cause and spread of infectious diseases. And 4. Generate ideas on the mechanism to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Pupils, can you differentiate between infectious and non-infectious diseases? Let's do it together, shall we? First, let us compare the causes of infectious and non-infectious diseases. Infectious diseases are caused by dangerous pathogens often carried by vectors. Non-infectious diseases are usually caused by genetics or by a person's lifestyle. Infectious diseases can be transmitted from one person to another, but non-infectious diseases cannot be transmitted to another person. The examples of infectious diseases are tuberculosis, ringworm, flu, dengue fever, and of course, COVID-19. Some examples of non-infectious diseases are cancer, asthma, diabetes, and hypertension. Pupils, do you know how infectious diseases are spread? Infectious diseases can spread by being waterborne, by being airborne, through body contact, and by vector-carrying pathogens. Let us discuss each of these methods. Pupils, some diseases can be transmitted through water. Infections that occur through water usually happen in areas with poor sanitation, with inadequate water supply, or which are often hit by floods. Cholera is a waterborne disease. It is spread through contaminated water. Cholera causes severe watery diarrhea, which can lead to dehydration and even death if it is left untreated. So, how can this waterborne infection be prevented? Do you have any suggestion, pupils? Let's see. We should use clean water from reliable sources. We should boil our water before drinking. Adding chlorine to swimming pools can help to kill pathogens. Having a good sanitation system is very important. 
Then, wash your hands every time after using the toilet. Bless you. Pupils, why must you cover your mouth with a piece of tissue when sneezing? It is not just good manners to cover your mouth when coughing or sneezing. Doing so helps to reduce the spread of germs. When you close your mouth during sneezing or coughing, the germs in your body are not released into the air around you. If not, you could make others sick. Airborne infections spread when bacteria and viruses travel on dust particles or small respiratory droplets. Now pupils, do you know the reasons why we need to wear face masks? Yes, well done! Face masks protect us from airborne diseases transmitted by bacteria and viruses in the air. Airborne diseases can be prevented by always doing the following. 1. Cover your mouth and nose with tissue when you cough or sneeze. Then, throw away the used tissue into the dustbin. 2. Do not spit everywhere. 3. Avoid crowded places. And 4. Make sure your home gets enough light as UV light can kill certain microorganisms in the air. Some diseases such as ringworm can be transmitted by touching the infected areas or sharing the clothes of the infected person. Ringworm is the most common skin infection that is caused by fungus. It is usually red and itchy. Some diseases such as syphilis and the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV can be transmitted through sexual intercourse and blood transfer. So, we should practice good hygiene and a healthy lifestyle to protect ourselves from diseases. Okay? It is! What is a cockroach doing here? Boys and girls, a cockroach is an example of a vector. What is a vector? A disease vector is any agent which carries and transmits an infectious pathogen to another living organism. Can you give me another example of a vector? Yes, very good! Rats, flies and mosquitoes are all disease vectors that carry pathogens. Do you know what pathogens are? Pathogens are terms given to microorganisms that cause disease. Bacteria, viruses, protozoa, worms and fungi are all pathogens that cause disease. Let us look at some examples of vectors and their pathogens. Cockroaches and flies carry the same pathogen, Salmonella typhi, that causes typhoid. Symptoms for typhoid are fever, intestinal bleeding, and rashes on the body. Rats are vectors for Leptospira species. This is bacteria which causes Leptospirosis disease. People infected with this disease experience fever, headache, and muscle pain. Mosquitoes are a vector for viruses that cause dengue, malaria, and Zika. Pupils, 
let me explain to you an example of how vectors spread diseases. First, flies pick up pathogens from the exposed trash and carry these pathogens on their body. Next, the flies transfer these pathogens onto our food. And then, when a person eats the contaminated food, he will get sick. Let us take a look at another example of how vectors spread diseases. First, an uninfected mosquito bites an infected person. It becomes infected. This mosquito then bites a healthy person. When this happens, the virus is transmitted from the mosquito to the person. This person then becomes infected. Boys and girls, let us now learn about our body defense system. After this, you should be able to 1. Elaborate and communicate about the function of the body defense system. 2. Define antigens, antibodies, and immunity. 3. Justify the importance of immunization. And 4. Differentiate passive immunity and active immunity. Now, pupils, the first line of defense is our skin and mucous membrane. The skin covers almost all parts of our body to prevent infection from pathogens. Microorganisms can only get into the body if the skin is injured. Sweat and sebum are secreted by the skin which contains chemicals that can kill microorganisms. Pathogens that successfully get past the skin will enter the bloodstream. The respiratory system is lined with a mucous membrane that secretes mucus. Microorganisms that enter the respiratory tract are filtered by nasal hair and trapped by mucus lining. Earwax and tears function as antiseptics that kill microorganisms. Oh no! Some pathogens have managed to enter the skin. Pathogens that successfully get past the skin will enter the bloodstream. Fear not, the second defense line is here. The white blood cells will engulf and digest these pathogens using enzymes. This process is called phagocytosis. Pathogens that succeed in passing the second line of defense will have to face the third line of defense. The third line of defense is our body's immune system. When a pathogen, known as an antigen, enters the body, the immune system is able to recognize it. The immune system will produce antibodies in response to the presence of pathogen. Antibodies attack these antigens by binding to them. The binding of an antibody to antigens causes the pathogens to clump together and prevent them from entering the host cells. Immunization is an effort to stimulate the body's defense against infections by injecting vaccines into the body. What is a vaccine? A vaccine contains antigens obtained from weakened or dead virus or bacteria. 
a vaccine is used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases. Babies in Malaysia need to be injected with a few types of vaccines so that their bodies form immunity against several diseases. Immunity can be classified into two types. One, passive immunity. Two, active immunity. Both types of immunities can be obtained either naturally or artificially. What does this mean? Well, passive immunity is either natural or artificial. Maternal passive immunity is immunity which is passed along from mother to child. After birth, an infant receives passive immunity to diseases from antibodies found in its mother's breast milk. Artificial passive immunity comes from injected antibodies created within a different person or an animal. Passive immunity lasts only for a few weeks or months. Active immunity results from a person's exposure to a disease or infection or from vaccination. This triggers the immune system to produce antibodies against that disease. So, if an immune person comes into contact with that disease in the future, their immune system will recognize it and immediately produce the antibodies needed to fight it. Active immunity is long-lasting and sometimes lifelong. These two graphs show two types of natural immunity, P and Q. Okay, let us analyze these graphs together, shall we? Graph P shows the level of concentration of antibodies in the blood against the immunity level. The concentration of antibody reduces and stops after a few weeks. Can you name the type of immunity in P and Q? Yes, well done! P is passive natural immunity and Q is active natural immunity. Here is a question for you to think about. In your opinion, which immunity is better? Can you give a reason for your choice? Artificial is something made or produced by human beings rather than occurring naturally. So, what does artificial immunity mean? Hmm. Passive artificial immunity is when an antiserum is injected into the patient's body. The rabies vaccine and snake antivenom are two examples of antiserums. This type of immunity provides immediate short-term protection. Active artificial immunity is when an antigen is introduced through vaccination. This type of immunity provides long-term protection. When there is an imbalance in our body, the immune system becomes weak. What are the causes that weaken our body's immune system?
Our body's immune system can be weakened by exposure to pollution, stress, and consuming excessive sugar. What should we do to strengthen our body's immune system? We should get enough sleep, do exercise regularly, do not smoke cigarette, and go for periodic health checks. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed how we live and interact socially. Let us all practice the Standard Operating Procedures or SOP and take the advice given by our Ministry of Health. We should always keep good personal hygiene, wear a mask and maintain social distance while in any public area. Well, boys and girls, that's the end of today's lesson. Stay safe, everyone. See you soon. Bye.